Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Inshallah, we're going to begin with a quick recitation of the Quran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanu rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La yuhibbu Allahu al-jahna bis-su'i min al-qawri illa man gulin wa kana Allahu sami'an ahlima. يَتَّخِذُونَ أُولَئِكَ هُمْ الْكَافِرُونَ حَقًّا وَأَعْتَدْنَا لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا مُهِينًا وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَلَمْ يُفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِنْهُمْ أُولَئِكَ سَوْفَ يُؤْتِيهِمْ أُجُورَهُمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا يَسْأَلُكَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ أَنْ تُنَزِّلَ عَلَيْهِمْ كِتَابًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَقَدْ سَأَلُوا فقد سألوا موسى أكبر من ذلك فقالوا فقالوا أرنا الله جهرة فأخذتهم الصاعقة بذلهم ثم اتخذوا العجل من بعد ما جاءتهم البينات فعفونا ذلك وأتينا موسى سلطانا مبينا ورفعنا فوق ومطور بميثاقهم وقلنا لهم ادخل الباب سجدا وقلنا لهم وقلنا لهم لا تعلوا في السبت واخذنا منهم ميثاقا غليظا. سبحان الله العظيم. Today inshallah we'll be covering the tafsir of Surah Al-Ma'idah which is the fifth chapter of the Quran. It is a madani surah and it has 120 uh, ayat. This surah is also a twin surah of the previous one. As I mentioned before, there are certain surahs of the Quran, they come in pairs. We have already done the first pair, Al-Baqarah and Al-Imran. The second pair is Surah Al-Nisa and Surah Al-Ma'idah. The both of them were revealed in Medina. The both of them are of the same size. Both of them are over 20 pages. Al-Ma'idah being 22 pages long and and Nisa being approximately 28, 29 pages long. The both of them also cover similar topics about حقوق العباد, fulfilling the rights of your fellow human being. Also, some topics are almost identical. For example, the discussion about the Trinity, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses this in both surahs. In Surah Al-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يا أهل الكتاب لا تغلوا في دينكم ولا تقولوا على الله إلا الحق إنما المسيح عيسى بن مريم رسول الله وكلمته ألقاها إلى مريم وروح منه. A similar topic is also mentioned in سورة المائدة. لقد كفر الذين قالوا إن الله هو المسيح بن مريم. أن لقد كفر الذين قالوا إن الله ثالث ثلاثة. So the topic of the Trinity is addressed in both of the surahs. المائدة Linguistically means the table spread. And it gets its name from an incident that occurs at the very end of the surah. What is that story? It is the disciples of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam requesting Isa alayhi salatu wasalam to pray to Allah to send them a table spread from heaven. Right? They wanted basically a table spread from Jannah and they wanted to see this miracle happening right before their eyes. Okay, this is addressed at the end of the surah. They said, is it possible that your Lord can send down to us a, a table spread from Jannah? And then Isa alayhi salatu wasalam made the dua. He said, um, oh my Lord, oh our Lord, send them a table spread, right, from the heaven. And I was mentioning this morning that some of you might have seen depictions 
right? Here in the West, where they have Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, Jesus, peace be upon him, sitting with the disciples, breaking bread. Like this is like a special event. And some of our scholars have mentioned, perhaps this is a remnant of this story, right? That Isa alayhi salatu wasalam asks Allah for this table spread, and they're given exactly that. So this is how the surah gets its name. Also, one of the main topics that is discussed in the surah are dietary law, halal and haram, right? And we can guess this from the name, a table spread, right? When you have a table spread, then of course there's food. And this is what the surah primarily uh, speaks about. Now, there are a lot of laws that are discussed in Surah al maida It's kind of similar to Surah Al-Baqarah in that regard. It's very similar because it has a lot of laws. So inshallah, I'm going to go over some of the unique verses and unique topics that are discussed here and they're not repeated elsewhere. If you're looking at the screen, you should see all of these unique verses inshallah. So let us go over them one by one. The first ayah is, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu awfu bil uqood. O you who believe, fulfill your pledges. Awfu bil uqood. Now, what type of pledges does this include? This is actually very comprehensive. It includes all types of pledges and promises that we make. And one scholar, Imam Raghib al-Asfahani, he mentions that contracts can be divided into three types. There are three types of pledges or promises that we make. The first type of promise that we made is the promise we made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he took the progeny of Adam from his back and he addressed them in alam al-arwah, in the world of the spirits, alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And all of us responded by saying, yes, indeed. It is called ahdi alas, the covenant of am I not. So we must fulfill that covenant. The second promise is the promise we make with another the person. You promise someone to do something, you must fulfill that. The Prophet said, Al Muslimuna ala shurutin. And also the Prophet said, La dina liman la ahdala. There is no religion for the one who cannot keep his promise. And the third type of promise is the promise that you make to yourself the nadar or the vow that you make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if I get this job or I pass this exam, I'm going to fast for two days or I'm going to you know, recite this much Quran. So when you make something obligatory upon yourself, now you must fulfill this promise. This is called nadar or a vow in Islam. Um, Surah Al-Nisa begins with Ya Ayyuhan Nas and this surah begins with Ya Ayyuhan Ladin Amun. So you can see the similarity and the difference at the same time. The second verse also mentions a unique principle that is not mentioned elsewhere. And that is Help and assist others in committing good but do not help and assist others in committing a sin. So if you help someone to do a good deed, if you help someone to read the Quran, and then he continues to read the Quran, you would actually get the reward as well without that person losing any of his reward. But the same, true, the same thing is also true when it comes to committing a sin. If you encourage others to commit a sin, you assist others in committing a sin, even if you yourself don't do it, you get the sin as well. For example, you yourself may not be eating or drinking haram. You are not drinking alcohol. But if you serve someone haram, you will also be getting the sin as well. You yourself may not be drinking alcohol, but you're serving it. You're driving a truck for, say, Budweiser company, even though you never drink wine yourself. But if you are doing this job, this will be haram because of i'ana al masiyah this important principle that is mentioned here. And this leads me to a very important question that many people have about their jobs, that which one is halal and which one is haram, because it seems that every job 
it's somehow connected to a sin, right? At some point, you are going to be included in the chain. So does that mean every single job is haram? The answer is no. Only when you are directly involved, then it is haram. If you're not directly involved, then the sin will not fall on you. For example, if you're a mechanic fixing cars, and then a person is going to use that car for something haram, right? He's going to use that car to drive to a place that is haram, right? He's going to listen to something haram in the car. In this case, the sin does not fall on you because the car has many purposes, right? So therefore, the sin would not fall on you. But it only has one purpose, which is haram, and then you are providing that service, then it would not be allowed. Another example I can give is of grapes. If you're just selling grapes, this is fine because it has multiple uses. Some people can buy the grapes and just eat the grapes. Others can make juice out of it, grape juice, and still others can make wine out of it. In this case, by you selling grapes, it's fine. But if you were to sell wine, that that would be haram, even though you yourself, you're not drinking it, but you're directly assisting others in committing that sin. So this is how we differentiate, okay? Is a job halal or not? It's based on this principle. Are you directly assisting others in committing a sin or not? Okay, the third ayah deals with dietary laws, the halal and haram in our deen. And this is very important because as the saying in English goes, you are what you eat. And this is also true from an Islamic point of view. Whatever you eat has an effect on you, on your spirituality, and especially on your du'as. It is said about one Sahabi by the name of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas anhu, that he was well known for his du'as, right? He was one whose du'as were always accepted. So someone asked him the reason, and he said, the reason is, I have never taken a morsel of food, except that I've always investigated as to where the source of that morsel of food was, right? So the purer the, your food, the easier it is for your dua to be accepted. They say the example of haram food is like poison. If you consume poison unintentionally, there's no sin on you, but the effect of it will still be there. Okay, it would harm you physically. If you do it intentionally, of course, you'll be committing a sin and it will have its effect. The same thing with haram food. If you eat haram food intentionally, you will have the sin of consuming haram and it will affect your spirituality. If you do it unintentionally, there is no sin upon you, but it will also have, it will still have an effect, a certain level of effect on your dua. So we need to be very, very careful about what we consume. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he said, Inna Allah la yaqbalu illa tayyiba. Verily, Allah is pure and he only accepts that which is pure. Wa inna Allah amara al-mu'mineena bima amara bihi al And Allah has commanded the prophets, he has commanded the believers with the same thing that he has commanded the prophets with. So in one place, Allah addresses the prophets by saying, Ya ayyuhar rusul, kulu min al-tayyibati wa amalu saliha. O messengers, eat of what is pure and do righteous deeds. Because if you eat halal, you will be inclined to do what is permissible and halal. And if you eat haram, you will be inclined to do what is impermissible and haram. And in another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the believers by saying, Ya Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the person. That you have a person who is traveling. He is disheveled, right? His appearance is unkept. And he's making dua to Allah, raising his hands, saying, Oh my Lord, oh my Lord. But still his dua is not being accepted. Even though there are so many reasons for his dua to be accepted. He's a traveler. He is in a humble state. 
He's raising his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is an added etiquette of dua. He's saying, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, which could be maybe Ismullah al A'zam, right? So he has all of these factors in order to get a quick answer to his dua. Yet it is still rejected. Why? What he eats of is haram. What he drinks of is haram. What he wears is haram. So how would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answer his prayer? Okay. So we have to be very careful of what we eat. Now, especially when it comes to uh, halal and haram, it primarily deals with meat, right? When it comes to everything else, of course, it's halal as long as you earn it, right? You don't steal it. Uh, you don't steal anything. If it's uh, grain, vegetables, right? All of these things, it's halal, right? As long as you eat in moderation, um, you know, it's, it's pretty flexible when it comes to uh, the, um, anything related to uh, vegetables and grain, rice, and things of that nature. When it comes to uh, meat, when it comes to chicken, when it comes to, uh, you know, goat and sheep and the big animals, then there are certain requirements that must be fulfilled, certain conditions that must be fulfilled in order for it to be halal. So to simplify everything, there are four main conditions. Okay, in order for an animal to be halal, all four of these conditions have to be met. Even if one of them is missing, the animal will be considered haram. So, what is the first condition? The animal itself has to be halal. It has to be a goat, a sheep, right? A cow, right? A buffalo, an ox. All of these are halal animals. You cannot eat animals uh, that are predators, animals of prey a tiger, a lion, a cheetah, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the first condition. And I have them written over here as well, by the way. The second condition is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be mentioned at the time of slaughtering the animal. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Do not eat anything upon which the name of Allah has not been mentioned. So the first reason is because Allah has mentioned it in the Quran, because Allah said so. That's the simple answer. And another logical reasoning that can be mentioned is that every life is sacred. And you have no right to take the life of any creature unless you mention the name of the one who gave you the, you know, who, who allowed you to take the life of this animal. So this is the second condition, mentioning the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third condition is that the animal must be slaughtered, right? And the reason for this is because blood is considered to be impure. It's haram, right? And also, from a health perspective, it is very toxic, right? You should not be consuming blood, flowing blood. So you have to slaughter the animal. The blood has, the animal has to bleed out. You must cut the two jugular veins, the trachea, the esophagus. And then once the animal bleeds out, then you can consume the animal. If you don't slaughter the animal, if you just shoot the animal and it dies, or you take a log, right, and you kill the animal and it dies, it will be haram. If it falls from a high place, right, and it dies, it's haram. And all of this is mentioned in the third verse, Surah Al-Ma'idah, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَ وَالدَّمُ وَلَحْمَ الْخِنْزِيرِ وَمَا أُذِلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ بِهِ Basically, it mentions a list of all of these animals that have not been slaughtered properly. And then the fourth condition is the slaughter must be a Muslim or from Ahli Kitab. But this is where many people get confused. It's one of the conditions. It's not the only condition. The slaughter, just simply being Ahli Kitab, it is not sufficient. All of the other conditions must also be fulfilled. And it is no different than in the same verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, you can marry uh, the, the woman of the people of the book. But of course, all of those conditions must be met. They cannot be from the Muharramat, they cannot be a close relative and all of that. That's not mentioned here, but it is understood. So same thing when it says, you can eat from the people of the book, all of those other conditions and verses that are mentioned elsewhere, they must be fulfilled as well. 
But let me give you an example. If someone was to slaughter an animal, right? Say it's a halal animal, a chicken. He mentions the name of Allah, but the person is an atheist. He's not a Muslim or a kitabi. Then the animal would not be halal because the fourth condition is missing. If a person slaughters an animal, it's a halal animal, and he slaughters it with his hand, right? But he mentioned the name of Isa alayhi salatu He says in the name of Jesus, in the name of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Gilani, or something like that, then this will not be permissible, okay? So if any one of these conditions are missed, then the animal will not be uh, halal. Okay, the fourth ayah, it talks about, again, a unique fifth point that is not mentioned elsewhere, and that is hunting dog. Generally, you are not allowed to keep a dog inside of the house, but an exception has been made for two types of dog. One is security dog, and the other one is um, a hunting dog, okay? So you are allowed to use a dog for hunting if it is trained, and also that you mention the name of Allah when you send the animal. Which shows, by the way, the importance of saying tasmiyah. Okay? So when it comes to this topic about machine cut and hand cut, see, the question is, is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being mentioned or not? Right? And this is where this whole discussion comes into play. If the name of Allah is not being mentioned on every animal, then you know that this is definitely problematic. Because over here, even when you use the hunting dog and you send it out, you must mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're using an arrow to you know, hunt an animal, you must also mention the name of Allah. Okay? When you're slaughtering it, you must also do um, the tasmiyah pronouncing the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is verse number four. Verse number five is food and marriage with the people of the book, okay? And I'm sure all of us know that this is allowed, but all of the conditions have to be met, which are mentioned elsewhere. Number six, verse number six talks about wudu, okay? The only surah that talks about wudu before salah. إِذَا قُمْتُ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ فَاقْسِلُوا وَجُوهَكُمْ وَيَدِيَكُمْ الْمَرَافِقِ وَمْسَحُوا بِرُوسِكُمْ وَرَجِلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in one hadith, he was passing by the, you know, the cemetery of Medina, the Qi' al gharqad or Jannat al baqir as we know it in our culture. He was passing by the cemetery and he said to the Sahaba, I wish if I could see my brother. To the Sahaba, they said, aren't we your brother? The Prophet Sallallahu said, no. You are my companions. My brothers are those who have believed in me or who believe in me, but they have not seen me as of yet. Referring to the later generation of Muslim, of me and you, inshallah. But the Prophet is expressing his desire to meet us. Then the Sahaba, they said, O Messenger of Allah, how would you recognize your Ummah on the Day of Judgment? How would you distinguish your followers from the millions of followers of the other prophets. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave them an example. He said, tell me if there was a person who had a horse of one color and this horse was mixed with other horses that were also of the same color. The difference is this horse had streaks of white hair on his forehead and on its legs. Wouldn't the owner be able to distinguish this horse from the rest? They said, Bala, yes, of course. So the Prophet wasallam said, similarly, on the day of judgment, my followers will be presented before me in a state that their hands, feet, and faces will be shining bright because of the effect of wudu. Inna ummati yud'awna yawm al-qiyamah ghurra min hajilina min athari al-wudu wa min ispa'a min tuma yutayla ghurratahu falyaf'al. Verse number eight says, <clears throat> Malice against the people shouldn't prompt you to injustice. Okay? It is reminding the Sahaba that just because the Quraysh, they prevented you from entering the Haram, now you shouldn't try to seek revenge by preventing them when they want to go to the Haram. 
That is the meaning of the ayah. Okay. You do not repel evil with evil. They prevented you from the haram. But if they want to go and perform pilgrimage, let them do so. Verse number 12, verse number 9 speaks about stories of people were planning to assassinate the Prophet. Verse number 12 to 19 talks about the pledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from Bani Israel. And the surah begins with what? Fulfill your promises, your pledges. And because of their breaking of these promises, because of it, they were cursed. Uh, verse number 20 to 26 talks about the story of Bani Israel when they were detained in, uh, in, the, in the desert for 40 years as a punishment because they refused to fulfill or follow the orders of Musa alayhi salatu Verse number 27 to 32 talks about the story of Habil and Qabil. Habil and Qabil are the two sons of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. Cain and Abel in the Old Testament. One of them killed the other. Right? Cain killed Abel. Right? Qabil killed Habil. Relate unto them the story of the two, two sons of Adam. When the both of them presented an offering. Right? Qurban. The Urdu word qurbani comes from the Arabic word qurban, which means anything that brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's interesting, in Hebrew, they also have a similar word, qurban, right? Qurban, qurban, qurbani, it all has the same meaning, right? An offering that you give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If qarraba qurban, when the both of them presented an offering, it was accepted from one and not the other. One was sincere. Abil was sincere, but not Abil. And one of the ways that their offering will be accepted is that a fire would be sent down from the heaven and would burn the offering. And this is how they would know that their offering has been accepted. So Abil was sincere. He brought the best offering that he could find. As opposed to Abil, he did the exact opposite. He was insincere. So Allah accepted from Habil and not Habil. So Habil, uh, he became very upset. He said, لأقتلنك, that I'm going to kill you. And so Habil, he said, Allah only accepts from those who are pious and righteous. Anyways, the story continues that Habil went and killed Habil. And the Prophet said, this was the first murder that took place on this earth. And every sin that happens of this nature, part of that sin would fall on the shoulder of Habil because he was the one who introduced this sin, right? And it shows that when it comes to committing a sin in public, we have to be very careful. We should be cautious. You know, we should be careful of committing you know, all types of sins. We should be cautious of everything, but especially when you do something in public because then other would follow you as an example. And when they commit those sins and they continue, you will be getting a share of that sin as well. All right, inshallah, we'll stop here. You could see all of the notes here and I send it to everyone as well. There are more um, points as well in the surah, but I'm going to hand it over to Mufti um, Bilal, inshallah, to just quickly tell us about um, the next two, three parables, inshallah, from Surah Al-Imran. We did Surah Al-Baqarah. Now we're going to move on to Surah Al-Imran, inshallah. Just very quickly, inshallah, in four or five minutes. And then we have this desire to tell us the last dua. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So inshallah, very quickly, we'll go through the three parables that have been mentioned in uh, Surah Al-Imran. Uh, the first one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَعْتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا That hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together and do not uh, have division among yourselves. So over here, the parable is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the words 
the rope of Allah. And over here the Mufassirun explain that the rope of Allah over here refers to the Quran. Because just as how, if for example, a few people are in the are in the water, they're drowning, uh, they're about to you know lose their life, and you throw them a rope. This is their lifeline, and all of them will hold on to that rope, and you will be able to pull them onto the boat, onto deck, and bring them back to safety. So similarly, all the Muslims, we all believe in the Quran, we all agree, despite our minor, major differences, whatever the case may be among ourselves, but when it comes to the Quran, we all agree uh, upon the Quran that this is the word of Allah, this is the book of Allah, and we have to hold on to it. So Allah says, if you hold on to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the rope of Allah, this is your lifeline, and you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you will find the hidayah and the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first parable. The second parable, just a little bit after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَا حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ that you were on the brink of fire for anqadakum minha and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected you. So over here, the brink of fire, this is another parable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here is referring to the differences that occurred between the people of Medina. So as we know, before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, and even after he came to Medina, there were two main tribes in Medina. They were the Aus and the Khazraj. And they were always at loggerheads with one another, always fighting uh, and quarreling and, you know, always at war with one another. And they could never get along. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that before Rasulullah came and before this hidayah and guidance came to you, you were always in this uh, state of fighting uh, and quarreling and in disbelief. And so this led you to the, uh, on the border and on the brink of falling into the fire, the fire meaning of Jahannam because of your misguidance and because of your deviation. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to you. You accepted his message. You became brothers. The brotherhood was established and you took the hidayah. You accepted the hidayah. So you were protected from falling into the fire, meaning the misguidance and ultimately the fire uh, of Jahannam in the hereafter. So that is the second um, uh, parable. And the third parable, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, sorry, that's another parable. The other parable, the third parable Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about over here a garden. And the strong wind like a tornado surrounds this garden and completely desecrates and destroys the entire garden, all the trees and the fruits and everything that was in there. All of it is destroyed as, and removed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, referring over here to the good actions of the kuffar and the disbelievers. A lot of kuffar and disbelievers who do a lot of good work, especially when it comes to charity, welfare work, society, etc. They do a lot of good work, but they're kuffar. So that's the example of the garden. All the nice things, the fruit, the trees, all that. That is the garden. That is their good work. And then their kufar and their disbelief is like that tornado that it comes and it just destroys and desecrates all that good work they did. So similarly, the, the kufr comes and their kufr overpowers and overwhelms the good work they do and it destroys everything and they have no reward by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So of course, in order for your good work to be accepted by Allah, you need to believe in Allah. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives this uh, a parable. So these are the three parables in Surah Ali Imran. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this iman. We have ask, we ask Allah to keep us steadfast upon iman, to grant us the ability to stay steadfast upon the hidayah and the guidance so we may be protected from the fire of Jahannam and so that whatever good we do, inshallah, it is accepted in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For Surah Al Imran, you should always remember these three images. If I were to ask you, you should know what they represent. One of them is a rope just dangling from the heaven and everyone coming and holding on to the rope. What does this represent? The second one is there's a huge pit fire and people are about to fall into it and someone comes and rescues them. That's the second parable, the second imagery that you should have. And the third one is a beautiful garden, right? And you're expecting so much from it. Right? The season is near for harvest, and all of a sudden, a tornado comes and completely demolishes, destroys the whole garden. That's the other parable. You should know from now, you should know what that represents uh, based on the explanation that was just given. Okay, Mufti Zayd, the last dua, inshallah, of Surah Al-Baqarah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa wa ala rasulihi al-kareem. Inshallah, tonight we will be discussing the last um, two ayats of Surah Al-Baqarah, which is our fifth um, Quranic dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains and mentions in the Quran, رَبَّنَا لَا تُعَاقِذْنَا إِنَّ سِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَأْنَا 
ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به وعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين which means oh our lord do not punish us if we forget or make a mistake O oh, our Lord, do not place a burden upon us like the one you placed upon those before us. O oh, our Lord, do not burden us with what we cannot bear. Pardon us, forgive us, and have mercy upon us. You are only, you are our only guardian, so grant us victory over the disbelieving, disbelieving people. As we all know, these are um, the last ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had granted these ayat to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had gone for it. Mi'raj. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi has been reported uh, in a hadith to mention that Hazrat Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu explains, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi upon one occasion he explained that these ayat were given to him, meaning Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from beneath the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the treasures, the treasures that are beneath the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the person who recites these ayat at night, meaning from Aman al Rasulu all the way to the end of the Jews, to, to the end of the Surah, the last two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, this will suffice for a person. Different meanings, what does it mean by it will suffice? Number one, um, some of the scholars mentioned that, for example, if a person is not able to wake up for Salat al-Tahajjud, it will take the place of his Salat al-Tahajjud. Obviously, a person should come into the habit of reciting these ayat uh, before he goes to sleep. Um, when it comes to these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching the mu'mineen to make this dua. What is this dua? In other words, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have commanded us to do many, many different actions. But at the end of the day, we are insan, we forget and we make mistakes. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not hold us accountable and do not punish us for the actions that we do either forgetfully or that we do by mistake. The second dua, Allah, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la tahmil alayna isra. Oh Allah, do not place a burden upon us like the one you have placed upon those before us. Mufassirin, they explain um, what does it mean by a burden that was placed upon the people before. They give the example of the people of the Bani Israel. One of the explanations is that the people of the Bani Israel, there were many rulings and ahkam that were difficult upon them. For example, if they wanted their toba to be accepted, the only way that the toba could be accepted is that they would be, they would, they would have to be killed. They could not repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same way, if their cloth or if something um, that they would be wearing, piece of cloth would get napak, would get impure, they would have to cut out that piece and they would have to throw that piece away. They would not be able to wash it like how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted in our deen. Other Mufassirin, they explain that what this is general, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that just as how the Bani Israel, when they had done evil actions and evil deeds, and how you had punished them, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not put us in that situation, that if we were to do evil actions, you punish us. In other words, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not burden us with that punishment that you had punished the people before. In the last dua, uh, O our Lord, do not burden us with that which we cannot bear. Meaning, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give us the ability to do that which is good. And obviously, do not put upon us that which, which we are not capable of doing. Allah concludes the surah by mentioning, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa'afu anna wa lana. O oh Allah, pardon us and forgive us and have mercy upon us. Each and every single one of us, we are always in need of the rahmah and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fansuruna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. And of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you grant us victory and you make us victorious over the disbelieving people. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those people that understand the Quran. Amin ya rabbal alameen. Subhanallah. Jazakallah khair, Mufti Zayn. Before we log off, I just wanted to use this opportunity to thank Mufti Bilal and Mufti Zayn for all of the hard work uh, that they are putting into this. You know, there's so much work that is being done behind the scenes that many of you may not know. And this is very, very difficult, especially for the Qufad who have to lead Taraweeh. Because when you lead Taraweeh, every Hafid has to at least recite their juz six, seven times, which pretty much takes the entire day. And then they have to give even lectures and some of them teach classes as well. And they're still finding time to actually prepare these slides. And then not only that, sit also for about 40, 45 minutes to actually, you know, uh, give you the presentation as well. Just wanted to really thank them because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَمْ nas, لَمْ The one who doesn't show gratitude to people hasn't showed gratitude to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So I just wanted to mention that we truly appreciate all of your hard work. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala reward you the best jaja in dunya and akhirah.